Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Hey, good morning, everybody. Oh, I'm just so happy today. I love the first weekend of March. Next weekend, Daylight Savings Time begins. I love that. It'll be light when we leave Saturday night after church services or after dinner. You can go out with the kids and play, send them outside. Um, Spring and two weekends. Uh, begins. Yes, so exciting. I love that garden centers are opening up, green greenhouses are opening up, and color is coming back. Stuff that was planted in the fall uh, is now coming up and we're seeing that and obviously uh, farmers and people are preparing the ground and people preparing their gardens and their yards to plant this spring. I just love this time. A few weekends ago on kickoff weekend, on Super Bowl weekend, if you remember, we did we looked at the analogies in the Bible of uh, often the Apostle Paul would use that of a racer, of an athlete, of a sporting event, and uh, he would use that analogy for our faith and what kind of faith we ought to have. I thought this weekend, on the first weekend of March, as we prepare for spring, that we would look at another illustration. It's one of Jesus' favorite illustrations for the life of faith, and that is the illustration of planting and farming. About half a dozen of Jesus' parables used planting and farming. About five dozen times in the New Testament, it uses the word fruit, as in like reaping a harvest of fruit. And harvesting is a major theme illustration in the New Testament. Because anytime a farmer plants or anytime you plant even a flower or, you know, a vegetable or something else, plant a tree, that's a great act of faith, is it not? You're putting something in the ground and expecting something great to happen, even though you can't see it. That's a testimony of faith. Of even though what your eye sees, you're believing and operating and working off of some other laws and things of beyond what you can see. So I want to look, uh, start with a parable from Jesus about what the kingdom of God is like, and he says it's like a a farmer scattering seed. So look at this with me. If you've got a Bible, it's in Mark chapter four on your outline, on the app or on the screen, lots of ways to interact with the word of God today. Jesus is giving parable after parable, and he also said, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First, a leaf blade pushes through. Then the heads of the wheat are formed. And finally, the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with the sickle. For the harvest time has come. Now this parable, this illustration is, is so simple, like you can sometimes even miss it. Like God's, Jesus is giving a parable here to simplify our understanding. He's saying the kingdom of God is a growing kingdom. And you may not even know how that's always happening. It kind of takes the pressure off. He's growing his kingdom. Okay, that's what he's doing. Uh, but it also happens in stages, And your growth happens in stages. It happens over time. There's a process to it. And Jesus would give this illustration many, many times. In fact, at the very end of Jesus' life, right before he died on the cross, one of the last things Jesus emphasized. I just kind of stopped there and think of all the things he could have said, of all the things he could have emphasized to his disciples, to his close followers, right before he goes to the cross, he brings back this illustration and he says, I want you to bear fruit. I want you to have a harvest in your life. And the very last thing he talks about, he gives an entire chapter in John 15 of the subject of bearing fruit and being productive. Fruit is a big theme in the Bible. It's a big theme in the New Testament. Obviously, Jesus cared enough about it. He says that's what he wants. And so in John 15, 8, there on your outline, Jesus makes this amazing statement. Let's just walk through it. He says, this is to my Father's glory, which hello, that's the old 
goal of our lives, the Bible says, is to give God glory with our life. And he says, this is to my Father's glory that, how do you give God glory? That you bear much fruit. That's how you glorify God. And it's how you prove, it's how you show yourselves to be my disciples. That the proof that I'm following him, that I'm being his disciple, the way that I'm giving glory to God, he says, is through bearing fruit. Now, that is the entire purpose, just a few observations here. That's the purpose, actually, of your salvation. Let's put that up on the screen. That is the purpose of your salvation. Jesus did not save you just so you could get to heaven. He did that. He wants to save you from hell. But he also saved you to serve and to bear fruit and to live a productive life for God. Think of it this way. God has made an investment into your life through creating you, through dying on the cross for you, through putting his Holy Spirit in you. He's made an investment into your life and one day you're gonna stand before God and he's gonna do an audit. He's going to judge your life and he's gonna say, what's the return on the investment? What did you do with the life and the gift that I gave you? What did you do with what you were given? And that's what the parable of the talents is all about. So bearing fruit is the purpose of your salvation and it fills, it fills you with joy. In John 15, Jesus said, this is, this is how you'll know real joy that you bear fruit. Real joy doesn't come from pursuing our own way, causing our own problems and solving our own problems and living for us. The most joyful thing is bearing fruit for Christ. Amen, somebody? That is where real joy is in life. One more observation here is a productive life is where the fruit lasts. There's a big difference between fruit that uh, blossoms immediately and then withers or rots or, or dies and fruit that lasts. And God says, I want you to have fruit in your life that lasts. Real fruitfulness is is not gonna be judged by how much you accomplished in life or how big of an impact you made. The real question of the fruit is, did it last? So yes, are there things you could do in your life to create a flash in the pan? Are there things that we could do in our ministries, church, create a, a flash in the pan or quick instant growth? Yes, but God says, I want fruit that lasts over time. I want real lasting fruit. In John 15, 16, he says, I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, I don't want this to be a a vague idea today or just simply an illustration that we walk away with and go, oh yeah, good illustration. Bearing fruit, planting, farming, harvesting. What is Jesus talking about when he's talking about bearing fruit? What's the Bible talking about when he's talking about harvesting fruit? Well, there are at least five kinds of fruit that are talked about in the New Testament. Uh, You might write these in. The first one is you'll see the fruit of repentance. Repenting is when you you turn your life over to God. You're, You're going this way, life under your control, you're setting the direction, and you have all these sins and problems and issues and all these things, your life that you've built, and you turn and you say, I'm, I'm moving my life from self-centeredness to God focus, and I'm turning, I'm gonna uh, believe what God has to say uh, about this, and I'm gonna repent. And when John the Baptist, you'll see, he said, bring forth the fruit of repentance. And now there he was talking to uh, religious leaders, like the Pharisees, and he goes, you guys aren't showing any fruit. Like you say all this stuff, but I don't see any change of heart. You talk all this, but I don't see any change of mind or change of heart or change of repentance. And he says, let's see it. Bring the fruit of repentance. Another form of fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is your character and that's throughout the New Testament. You can specifically see in Galatians 5, you see nine uh, fruits of the Spirit. That if you have spirit in your life, you're going to start bearing the fruit of love, of joy, of peace. There's a peace in your life that would not otherwise be there without the spirit. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You have a fruit of faithfulness. You're more faithful than you otherwise would have been. Gentleness and self-control. 
Now, that's your character. And sometimes when the Bible is talking about fruit, it's talking about the character of our lives, conforming our character to be like Christ, becoming more like Christ. The third kind of fruit is the fruit of sharing my faith. A third way the, the word fruit is used is it's the fruit of another Christian. The apple trees produce apples. Orange trees produce oranges. What does the Christian produce? More Christians, other Christians. Do you realize that you're the fruit, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're the fruit of someone else, of another Christian? Like that, maybe it took several people, but you're the fruit of a parent or a grandparent who shared their faith with you, or a, a pastor, or an author, a writer, or someone who's serving in children's ministry, or youth ministry, or a, a speaker, or someone who shared their faith. Maybe you're the fruit of several people. And one day they'll stand before God and Jesus will say, what's the fruit of your life? And you'll, you'll be pointed to, because you believe and you accepted, and, and they shared their faith with you. So you have the fruit. What kind, who's, who will be the fruit of Sharing your faith. Another fruit that I'll point out is the fruit of ministry to others. Every Christian is a minister. Every Christian is to serve God by serving others. Acts of service, acts of love, acts of care, acts of support. And every Christian is a minister. He wants us to show fruit or to be productive in this area. And one more is the fruit of generosity. God says, I want you to return part of what you earn, part of what you've given, and he says, I want you to return it to me. And he calls that sewing, not sewing needle, needle and thread, S-O-W, sewing. And that it's just, just as you would with a harvest, just as you would with a plant. You don't consume it all. You don't eat all the seed. You save a seed to plant more. And so that's the principle he's saying. Don't consume all of it. Take a seed of what you've earned, what you've been given, and replant it. Give it back. Return it to me. And he uses it to grow more fruit in your life, and fruit of ministry, and fruit of the work. Now, I don't want to go into, or don't have time really, to go into all the verses on this today. But Jesus uh, and his followers and the apostles are so serious about bearing fruit. In fact, it's some of the hardest verses in Scripture. In fact, there's a parable where Jesus uh, tells where he's going to a vineyard, and he's been there three years, three times, and uh, there's plant, this tree has no fruit on it, and he goes up to the gardener, and he says, cut this tree down, it doesn't bear any fruit, why should it take up good soil? Another place, John the Baptist said there's an ax being held at the root, and he says, every tree, this is in um, Matthew 3.10, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Like there is a call for a response with this message today, that God wants us to bear fruit. It is the purpose of our lives, the purpose of our salvation, and there is consequences if we don't bear fruit. So what we're talking about today is very joyous. It's also very serious to God. And there's a lot on the line. And so I really wanted to do the work this week because I want to know, okay, how? How do I bear fruit then? And I wanted to bring a message that says, okay, how, how, do we, how do we do this? Because I want you to bear much fruit in your life. And so I want to quickly just go through some steps that we see in Scripture with this illustration of how to bear fruit in our life. And the first one it's obvious. Now, there's several points here. I would encourage you as we go through this, take them all in, listen to all of them, but maybe just pick two at the end of the day. Say, I'm really going to reflect on this. I'm really going to act on this, okay? So several things, but re- really pick some uh, two ones that are really speaking to you today. But the first one's obvious is, I, I want to bear fruit. I got to plant good seed. Like, if I want the fruit of repentance, I need to repent. If I want the fruit of sharing my faith, I need to share my faith with someone. If I want the fruit of ministry to others, I need to serve somebody. If I want the fruit of generosity, I need to give. Everything starts as a seed. Every idea is a seed idea. Every dream starts out as as a seed of a dream. Every achievement starts out as a seed. Every church starts like they call it a church plant. It starts as a seed. Every business, that's why they call it starting a business, they call it seed money. Because it starts out as a seed. If you want fruit, you have to plant a seed. You have to begin. 
In John 12, 24 through 25, Jesus says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now Jesus here is talking about his life. He's talking about his death. And he's talking about giving his life. And he's making the point saying, I can't save you just through words. I don't save you just through good intentions. I don't save you just through a philosophy or a good idea. He says, I'm going to die on the cross in your place. I'm going to be buried like a seed in the ground and a great harvest will come from it. A seed was planted. Now, what are we talking about when we're talking about planting a seed? A seed is anything valuable. If you're taking notes, you might write this in. Anything valuable that I give away. When you give away praise, there's value to that. When you give away advice, there's good advice, there's value to that, right? When you give away your time, that's something valuable, there's value to that. When you give away uh, some money, there's value to that. When you give away your experience to someone who's not as experienced, there's value to that. When you choose to give away respect to your husband, respect your husband, there's value to that. Husbands, when you choose to give away love, love your wife, there's value to that. When you choose to give away trust to someone, say, I'm gonna trust you, there's value to that. Words can be seeds. What kind of seeds are you planting? Every week, I come up, I'm planting seeds. Planting is always an act of faith. It's an act of faith because you're saying something valuable is gonna happen from the thing that I'm giving away. And I'm not gonna keep it in my bag, I'm going to give it. And I believe that it's gonna produce some fruit. So when you have a need in life, what you really need to do is plant a seed. Wherever you have a need, plant a seed. So this March, when a a farmer goes out and uh, looks at his brown, barren field, and he sees no crops in his field, Uh, does the farmer gripe? Does he complain? No, he doesn't even pray. (laughs) He starts cultivating the field, preparing the field, and planting seed. And so whatever I need more of, I need to give give it away. You know this, if, if I need more energy, what should I do? I should take a seed of the energy that I have and use it to work out, to exercise to spend it on that. And what does that do? That produces more energy in my life. If I've got a little bit of talent and I want more talent, what do I do? Take some of that talent, plant the seed, use it, and God grows the talent. Whatever you need more of, you plant a seed and you give part of it away. And then just like you take a seed and plant it to bear fruit, number two, I must cultivate deep roots. You can have the greatest seed, but if you have no fruit, or you will have no fruit without the root. The root is what produces the fruit. And so I must cultivate deep roots. Now look at what God's word has to say about strong roots. This is a strong passage. It's a hard passage. But this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep down into the water. Such trees, they're not bothered by the heat. They're not worried about long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Now notice with me uh, the two types of trouble we see in this last verse uh, that you'll go through, that just this like tree goes through that we would go through. One is heat. And what's the heat in your life? That's when the pressure's on in your life. That's when things are closing in. It's tough times in life. 
And if you have no roots, you don't make it, make it through. And you gotta have deep roots to pull that water up out of the ground when the heat is pressing in on top. Uh, I learned this week that in the tropics, uh, banana trees are practically indestructible because of their roots. In fact, you can set a banana tree on fire, you can chop it up, you can bulldoze over it, and it's coming back. Why? Because it has like a 50-foot root system that's going to bring it back. The only way to get rid of a banana tree is to dig out the root system. Then notice it says that another type of trouble that you'll face is months of drought. What's that? That's when resources are limited. And I know some of you are going through a season, a time where resources are limited. Support is limited. You don't have the money you need, the support you need, the health that you need. And it's a time where resources are low. It's a time of drought in your life. How do you get by in limited resources in times of drought? You have deep roots. What, what do you call a plant without a root? That's a tumbleweed, right? It's just, it grows and immediately when the wind comes, it's uprooted and it blows around and you know people that are just blown around by the, they don't have roots in anything. But did you know that out in the desert there are not only tumbleweeds, but you can also find the saguaro cactus. And I've seen the cactus produce beautiful fruit even after times of months of drought. How does it do it? It will blossom and produce beautiful fruit even though when there's been no precipitation in months. It can go months and months and months without water. The secret is the root system. The root system. In fact, some trees in our nation, like in the Northwest, will have an integrated or interconnected root system. And those trees can face forest fires in the West and survive or come back because they have an interconnected root system that's stretching out sometimes for miles and miles. So you have a forest fire here, it's drawing from resources way over there. And that's what this church wants to help you with is we want to help you cultivate deep roots for the seeds of faith that you've planted. And we want to help you have an interconnected deep root system through our church family. That's why small groups are so essential during this spiritual growth campaign, this time of daring faith. That's why being connected to other believers and to a church family to grow those roots deeper down is so crucial. This afternoon, uh, I'll be teaching step one of the growth track, which I lay out our commitment to you and membership and your commitment to us and membership and how we can interconnect these roots to have a stronger root system. We love doing things that help you grow strong roots or a strong foundation, a firm foundation. In fact, soon we're going to be starting our, another round of our foundations classes, core truths to build your life on. So March 12th through May 7th, Sundays during this service in the East Auditorium, uh, we're going to be doing a, a deeper doc doctrine class on uh, creation, salvation, sanctification, and the church. Is this semester? That'll run through May 7th uh, because we want to just do, maybe you didn't get connected to a small group for Daring Faith and you want to get connected to something or maybe you're looking for just another opportunity uh, to grow. You can come to church Saturday night or earlier on Sunday morning and, and go to a foundations class uh, at 11 a.m. in there. And let's grow deep roots. Let me give you another key. I won't spend as much time on this one, but I must eliminate the weeds in my life, right? I mean, Jesus, okay, so Jesus illustrates this so clearly in uh, the parable of the soils. And he talks about the farmer who goes out and scatters seed. And he's broadcasting seed. That's where we get the term broadcasting from. Broadcasting is you're uh, broadcasting, projecting, whatever, something over a large area, and some people tune in and pick it up, and some people don't. Well, he's scattering the seed that way, and it's falling on different types of soil, and he says one of the types of soil is thorny weeds, and so what is the seed that fell among these thorny weeds? It's like those who hear God's teaching, now let's so, slow down and watch this now, but they let... Three things get in their way. Worries, riches, and pleasures. This is a callback to last week. Pleasures, lust of the flesh. Riches, lust of the eyes. Worry flows from the pride of life. They let those things in the way, keeping them from growing. So they never produce 
good fruit. You can't just plant a seed, you have to remove the weeds. And Jesus is saying that there are things in your life that are choking out your productivity. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we wrote down what's, what's a distraction that we're gonna cut out for daring faith. That's a weed that you're pulling up. You have to keep weeding. How's that going? What's that thing you need to cut out? Do you need to weed that thing again? Do you need to go through and weed again? Now, let me ask you this question. How much effort does it take to grow a weed? <laughs> Zero, right? In fact, one of my fears is you would drive by my house this week and you'd be like, this, guy's, this guy can't even grow grass and he's talking about harvesting fruit like you would see a lot of weeds in my yard, right? You never accidentally bear fruit. You accidentally grow weeds. Weeds are a sign of neglect. And so we got to weed the garden. That's the effort that you put in. But the fourth thing I must do, and this may be the point that hits home with you today that you're going to take with you today, is I must cooperate with God's pruning in my life. What is pruning? Well, pruning is where you not only cut off dead branches, unproductive branches, you actually cut off living branches that are bearing fruit or blossoming or growing so that you can improve the shape of something or stimulate the growth of it. Pruning is absolutely essential for your productivity. As a leader or as a father, or as a mother, as a business owner, as an employee, as a student, you've gotta go through pruning over, just as you weed and weed and weed, you go through pruning over and over and over again, many times in your life. Back to this passage in John 15, Jesus says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. God says, I prune you for effectiveness in your life. And I'm not only gonna cut off the dead things, but I'm gonna actually take some good things, some things that are even bearing fruit, and I'm gonna prune those back as well. And sometimes, you're gonna see areas of even success get cut away that you thought, well, this is wonderful, this is fruitful, and it will be pruned back, and it's never fun. I mean, there's been times in my life, there's been seasons in our church and times in our ministry where I thought, well, God, I thought we were doing a good thing there. Or God, that thing was bearing fruit. I thought that was a successful thing, a good thing. And over time, you see, okay, God was pruning, he's reshaping, he's gardening, for future uh, productivity, future fruit. When you go through pruning, it's often confusing. You know, they, they say to talk to your plants, you know, <laughs> encourage your plants. Have you read those articles and stuff? I often think uh, I'm the plant who starts talking back. <laughs> of, God, why are you cutting this? Don't you love me? God, why are you angry with me? God, why would you cut that off? I really enjoyed that. That's a good thing. And it can be confusing to go through a pruning process. God, why are you putting me on the shelf like this? God, why are you bringing this health problem into my life? God, why would you bring this, allow this physical pain to come into my life? Why did you bring this delay? And it's a huge mistake when we confuse pruning with punishment. They're two very different things. Pruning is for the future, punishment's for the past. And God took all the punishment out on Jesus. Jesus took your punishment on the cross. Uh, but he will discipline you. I mean, when you discipline your kids, what's that for? For the future. You're shaping them, molding them. You want them to bear fruit. And the Bible says it's never pleasant at the time. It's never fun at the time. But it bears fruit. And so he'll, he'll prune. He'll prune for future fruit. Friend, there is no circumstance in your life that God cannot use to help you grow. There is no circumstance in your life that God cannot use to develop fruit if you remain in him. I heard this week from a lady who went through a time of pruning. She was pregnant. She developed a very rare complication uh, where she could not get out of bed for four months. And at that time, uh, she was teaching a Bible study to hundreds of women. And it was the most successful thing in, in her life. And she'd become bedridden and all of that ministry and the study, everything came to a screeching halt. And she couldn't figure out why that was happening at that time. But during that time, 
lying on her back, looking up to God, she said, that God taught her truths and principles to build her character that prepared her for greater fruitfulness and challenges that she would face. Now here's my question. Can God's pruning in your life fail? Yes, it can. God's pruning in my life fails when I don't cooperate with it. Fails when you don't cooperate with it. But God God says, you know what? If you respond by trusting me, by remaining in me, you're going to see increased fruit and productivity in your life. Now, here's the next thing that we've got to uh, remember when we want to bear fruit, and that is number five. I'll do these last two very quickly. I must wait patiently and expect a harvest. Growing fruit takes time. You don't put a seed in the ground and the next day go out and look for apples on an apple tree. In fact, it, when does the fruit come? It comes in a whole different season than when you planted. Seasons pass before you're reaping fruit. And that's, I mean, when I plant something, I want to go out and dig it up and see how it's going. How's it looking in here, right? How's it going? You don't plant a seed and harvest the next day. Growing fruit is a process. It takes time. And nothing is more uncomfortable when you're in a hurry and God is not, right? Well, here's a couple verses of encouragement. Galatians 6, 9. Let's read this one out loud together. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Then in John 15, in this passage, kind of our our rooted passage here, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. The key word is to remain in him, to lean in to him. In in the time between planting and harvesting is not the time to give up on church, give up on your roots, give up on leaning into God, give up on prayer. You stay connected to him. You say, God, I want to be fruitful. I want to plant good seed. I want to develop good roots. I want to spend time with you. I want to weed out the distractions. I want to eliminate the stuff. I want to cooperate with the pruning. And you just say, God, I'm going to remain in you through this process. Now, when's the best time to do this? When's the best time to plant? We talk about timing in our church quite a bit. Well, when's the best time to plant a seed of faith? Best time to plant a seed of faith is now. (laughs) Now. There are a lot of things you can put off. The best time to plant is now. You don't wait for a better time. You don't say, well, when I retire, that's when I'm going to get really serious about God. Well, when the kids leave the house, that's when I'm going to get really serious about serving. When our finances look this way, that's when I'll get serious about giving. And when you have a need, you plant a seed. You plant it now. Ecclesiastes 11.4. Let's read this one together before we close. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Perfection paralyzes potential. I love how in Jesus' parable uh, that we kind of launched from today in Mark 4, he says the farmer doesn't know how it happens. I love that. You simply obey God, trust God, plant the seed, and you remain in him. God will never ask you to do anything by yourself. Never, never, never. He says remain in him. You produce fruit with him. You with him, him with you. And he will do it with you. Let's trust in him as we go to prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, I hope that some of the things we looked at today uh, would be like a seed, uh, your word planted in our lives and in our heart. And I pray that it would sink in, that it would uh, germinate, that it would grow, that it would transform our lives and form our lives and shape our lives. God, I pray for boldness that we would plant in faith, that we would begin sowing uh, seeds that produce uh, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of sharing our faith, the fruit of serving others, the fruit of generosity. And God, I just pray for uh, specifically uh, some different people in our church, maybe those who are going through a time of pruning, and it's very difficult. 
and they're watching things that they loved or things that they really enjoyed or facing challenges that uh, they didn't want to face, but they're going through a season of pruning. God, I pray that you would give them the strength to remain in you. God, I pray for the person who's going through a season of weeding and that's having to uproot the weeds in their life, of riches or worries or pleasures of this life. God, please give them the strength, the perspective uh, to follow through. God, I pray for the person who uh, is wanting to give up and they're ready to throw in the towel on, on sharing their faith, on serving others, on giving, on repenting, on working out their salvation and the fruits of the Spirit in their life. God, I pray that uh, just even these couple of verses would encourage them, that they will reap a harvest at the proper time if they do not give up, to remain in you, Christ Jesus. God, I pray for the young person in our church who's planting a lot of seeds in these days, seeds of how they relate to their parents, seeds of uh, in their school or seeds of their job or their career, seeds of friendship, seeds of how they'll believe in you and respond to the world and their worldview. God, I pray that they would plant good seed, they would cultivate good roots and that we would be a good church uh, to help them do that. God, I lift up our church family to you today. I pray that as we gather together for worship that it's an expression of our interconnected faith, of our root system, and um, a demonstration of honoring you and wanting to remain in you. King Jesus, we love you. And it's in your name we pray, and the church said, amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.